So the first thing, uh, the, the, the next thing that, that happened that really, I think, uh, helped explode our, our growth there was uh, we, we wrote a successful CFI grant. And this was back uh, about 10 years ago. And it really started with just kind of napkin sketches over coffee and, and, um, and beer. And we had a, a vision for this new building and, and a floor dedicated to um, translational uh, diabetes research. So that grant uh, was written back in the uh, early part of the uh, 2000s. Um, uh, we had partnered funding, and I'll, I'll come back to the issue of partners uh, again and again in this talk because we've had tremendous support from government and hospital partners. But we were funded by the CFI to build this um, uh, center, about 20,000 square feet, and you can see the laboratory space is all open. There's cores uh, in the middle uh, where the uh, equipment and technology um, exists, the laboratories around the outside, we call the dry lab space on the, on the right, is where um, clinicians are doing population health and uh, epidemiology and health services um, uh, research. And although it took a long time for partners to come together and for the building to be built, particularly for the Children's Hospital Foundation that had to raise about 40 million to, uh, to build the um, building, we were able to move into this uh, new space in uh, 2008. Um, the next step was to fill it with uh, people. And again, we went to uh, partners. And we had partners that uh, surprised me that they would come together. We have a sort of a dynamic tension between our university and the hospital foundation. Maybe have similar tensions here as they compete for donors. But we got everyone at the table, including the Canadian Diabetes Association. Their funding has always been, uh, their funding involved has always been for peer review. Uh, operating grants, but they were looking for a new fundraising initiative. So this was a specific initiative in BC where a certain population of donors were targeted specifically uh, to raise funds uh, to recruit um, uh, new faculty in diabetes research to this uh, center. And so over about a two or three year period, we were able to raise uh, $1.2 million to fund three new positions and we were given the green light to recruit. Uh, the Children's Hospital Foundation for a uh, fourth position. And so we started an open competition in 2008, around just before the building was completed and we, and we moved in. Um, we wanted a really transparent, open process. We wanted it to be completely external. We had um, search members from uh, all over the Vancouver Diabetes Research uh, community advertised widely. We did have some areas of focus we were interested in. We wanted to strengthen in emerging areas such as regenerative medicine and stem cell biology. Out of biology, we wanted to grow our strength in. We wanted researchers who were translational, who were complementary to the work that was uh, going on. And it was a challenging uh, task, uh, but we were able to come to this kind of nice space with startup money that UBC had contributed uh, as a partner. And uh, so we thought it was uh, we were going to be fairly competitive going after these <coughs> investors. Of course, the disadvantage of So uh, the last of these recruits have now been completed. They're all doing extremely well. And so um, you know, what I learned uh, from that is the value of, of really going with a, getting help in the process, going external, being very broad in your search. Uh, if, I won't go through each individual here, but you'll see that all of them have some sort of link to Canada or, or BC or Vancouver. So you know, I think sometimes you can homegrown talent back as long as they've gone away and uh, trained elsewhere. Yon, for example, did his PhD in physiology in 2003, but was in Zurich for six years. So um, this is, I think, one strategy for successful recruitment. We also didn't go after mid-career or senior investigators. We went after um, hungry postdocs who have been very successful in their postdocs. I think that helped us a lot. So they're all doing well. They all Two of them have salary awards, there's no awards, they all have CIHR offering grants. We also did a, a local move, Megan Levings, who's an outstanding um, transplant and T regulatory cell person in autoimmunity and transplantation. Um, she moved up to Vancouver Hospital and brought her CRC chair in cell transplantation, so her work has been transformed in the of what she does now is, uh, is diabetes. 
So this has uh, really helped us grow now with the new uh, people, the new funding. Uh, now we have almost 20 people involved in the program. 12 of them have laboratories on that floor, and the program brings in uh, about four and a half million dollars a year in funding. And what's been really gratifying is how the research has been. Uh, <laughs> so what's been really gratifying is uh, how the research has been transformed. We just got funding from the JDRF uh, and Canadian Clinical Trials Network for our first clinical trial. Mr. Kinemab um, uh, in the body for autoimmune. It's used in the arthritis. We're trying that in newly diagnosed type 1 uh, diabetics. The uh, industry partners that we've been able to work with, Gina Pangiotopoulos, in type 2 diabetes in youth. She's brought in banks and um, the government to fund the health uh, metabolic program. We're developing a biobank. We're involved now in much more knowledge translation just in the community of med school. And I'll come back to this in a moment. I hesitate coming into Jet's territory and mentioning that. So I should say that uh, Vancouver, uh, we, we love the Jets, especially when they're playing with the Leafs and other, uh, other teams. Uh, the, the Canucks have uh, been uh, contributed to our program. I'll come back to that. That's helped us uh, have sustainability to our, to our operation. Okay, so let me move into the science a bit. And, and now you have a bit of background about what we have there. Uh, hopefully you'll see how um, our, my own research in particular, I think, has just been really transformed by the, the people around me and, and, and the ability to do truly translational research. So we're focused on the islet in my group. Uh, we believe that beta cell failure is a critical part of the of uh, type 2 diabetes, here you see the uh, almost inevitable rise in blood sugars that occurs in this um, disease. Um, and this is accompanied by a loss of uh, beta cell function. So even before uh, overt diabetes is present at a time when uh, patients are pre-diabetic or have impaired glucose tolerance, you can detect uh, beta cell defects. Initially, as we become more insulin resistant with aging and obesity, beta cell mass increases, beta cell function increases to compensate for the uh, insulin resistance, uh, but eventually uh, beta cells fail and uh, glucose levels climb. And really no therapies for type 2 diabetes adequately target beta cell uh, failure. So this is a, a big issue. Almost all drugs do APDS studies show that the uh, progressive increase in blood glucose levels is almost inevitable no matter what the uh, therapy. So what causes the pancreatic beta cell to fail? There's underlying genetic defects, uh, likely. Uh, gene loss studies have shown uh, a number of uh, genes, susceptibility genes for type 2 diabetes that might be involved with uh, regulation of beta cell development and mass. But there's environmental stressors in the diabetic uh, environment that uh, there's a consensus now that I think that are very important. One being the toxic effects of hyperglycemia and hyperlipidemia, particularly free fatty acids, induce beta cell dysfunction and death, so called uh, leukolipotoxicity, the term coined by Mark Franklin in uh, Montreal. We've been very interested, I'll talk about it today, in the role of <coughs> aggregates of island amyloid polypeptide or IPP, amyloid deposits that form are toxic to the beta cell. And there's an emerging interest now, uh, and rightfully so, in island inflammation. Um, obesity, of course, is an inflammatory disease, and adipose tissue is associated with inflammation and obesity. But in type 2 diabetes now, it's becoming increasingly clear that within the island itself, there are uh, macrophages present in increased numbers, and they're activated to produce pro inflammatory cytokines that contribute to beta cell dysfunction. The beta cell is a sensitive beast. It's sensitive to uh, increased secretory demand, so it undergoes ER stress. There's probably oxidative stress present and some evidence that's recently published in the cell that it can undergo a de-differentiation to more of a progenitor state, which makes it less able to produce insulin response to glucose. And the end of this is beta cell apoptosis. Uh, people with type 2 diabetes can have about 50% of the normal mass of beta cells uh, and beta cell dysfunction impaired response of insulin to glucose or to a non-glucose challenge after a meal. And there's other defects present, uh, including impairment of the insulin precursor pro-insulin. So people with type 2 diabetes, as I'll show you in a moment, have elevated uh, pro-insulin to uh, uh, insulin ratios. 
So what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about some of these stressors and how we think they synergistically impact uh, things. Now, uh, one of the ways in which uh, our work has been impacted is by having great flavors, many of them Michael Hayden, Huntington's disease geneticists, and a lipid biology geneticist. And when Michael came to uh, the CFRI and, and developed the CMFT, I, I never thought we would uh, collaborate. Uh, but uh, because of the strong mentorship program and training program, and of course trainees really drive the training, and UBC has a very good MD PhD program, and we try to recruit these patients to CFRI into our program. So Ian Brunner, you see here, is a really outstanding MD PhD student in my Hayden's lab. So this is an area of research that's just really grown in our group in my lab now. And all of you know because I was sitting on Liam's committee. Um, and now Michael's lab uh, has a, a rather large component of uh, his work dedicated to diabetes research. So I'll tell you this story. So, so Michael uh, identified ABCA1, the cholesterol efflux transporter, as a cause of Tangier's disease. There's a mutation in that uh, transporter. So ABCA1 effluxes cholesterol uh, to HDL. So people with Tangier's disease have low HDL, they have mutations in the ABCA1 uh, gene. Uh, at a committee meeting of Liam's, uh, we started talking about the tissues in which it was expressed. And so he brought some, uh, or we took some islets and, and, and beta cell extracts uh, down to his laboratory to do westerns on it. We were surprised to see quite large expression, high expression of ABCA1 in pancreatic uh, beta cells. And because they had the uh, floxed mouse to enable tissue-specific knockout of uh, ABCA1, that we had mice with beta cell expression of pre to allow it to be knocked specifically out of beta cells. We made these mice and we're quite surprised to see a very marked impairment in glucose tolerance. So loss of ABCA1, specifically in pancreatic beta cells, induces a marked uh, glucose tolerance that gets worse over time, actually, as these mice get older, they get uh, overtly hyperglycemic, which is something that two years ago. We believe that this is due to an accumulation of cholesterol within the beta cell. But the cholesterol is critical for regular uh, glucose stimulated insulin secretion and beta cell secretory granule exocytosis. Uh, and I'll just show you some recent studies that suggest that this is the case. Um, here we're looking at insulin secretion from islets isolated from mice with beta cell specific knockout of ABCA1. Uh, and if we treat these islets ex vivo with methyl beta cyclodextrin, which will deplete cholesterol from the cell, sort of normalizes the increased cholesterol we regain glucose-stimulated insulin secretion. And data I'm not showing you that cholesterol is normalized. So this points to cholesterol as being player rather than ABCA1 uh, per se. We also did this in collaboration with Pat McDonald of the University of Alberta at Edmonton, where he does a, a patch-type um, apparatus where he can measure capacitance uh, of the beta cell membrane and measure secretory granule exocytosis. And so what he's done here, and he can deliver uh, the cholesterol to keep the substance to the middle of the cell. So you can see here, these are depolarizing pulses given to beta cells. And these are actually changes in capacitance of the cell membrane. They're exocytotic events. So beta cell exocytosis is uh, diminished in the ABCA1 block of uh, beta cells, but we can um, uh, regain it by depleting cholesterol. So we think it's a downstream exocytotic defect induced by cholesterol, perhaps cholesterol-rich microdomains uh, uh, involved in the um, fusion of the secretory granule with the plasma membrane. So cholesterol seems to be an important player uh, in insulin secretion and another paradigm to add to um, the toxic uh, effects of, of diabetogenic stressors on the beta cell. Is this happening in humans? Uh, so this is work done in uh, a group in collaboration with a group in uh, the Netherlands uh, who have uh, Tangier's patients. These are carriers of ABCA1 mutations, heterozygous carriers. And very nice clinical studies. They did um, CLAMP studies on these individuals and showed that they have impaired glucose tolerance uh, as well as impaired glucose stimulated insulin secretion. Here you see in, uh, carriers of these mutations. So ABCA1 
BRCA1 appears to be important in the beta cell in humans as well. And now we're moving to ways that we might be able to manipulate beta cell ABCA1 uh, as a way of ameliorating uh, beta cell dysfunction in, in diabetes. Uh, ABCA1, it turns out, is closely regulated by a microRNA, mirror 33 And recent studies done by a fellow in his lab, Adija Sakara, we've used uh, an adenovirus expressing an inhibitor of this, of this mirror 33 uh, and when we inhibit it, we get an increase in ABCA1 production in violence, ABCA1 expression. We then go to uh, an APOE knockout mice, which because of the APOE loss have accumulations of uh, cholesterol with hypercholesterolemia within their islets, and they have impaired glucose-stimulated insulin secretion. Uh, you can see that there on the right, uh, wild-type islets compared to APOE knockout islets. That's, uh, Old, uh, insulin secretion uh, associated with an increase in violent cholesterol. When we use the uh, mir 33 inhibitor, we uh, increase ABCA1 expression in these beta cells. We rescue um, insulin secretion by uh, decreasing violent cholesterol. So this suggests perhaps one kind of therapeutic approach that we can try. We're working to do these now, these studies in uh, vivo in mice fed a high cholesterol, high fat diet. So I would argue that maybe cholesterol accumulation should be added, uh, perhaps under the uh, category of, of, of lipid toxicity, as another stressor that can lead to uh, beta cell dysfunction that should be, should be considered. Okay, I'll talk next about our um, work on IPP as another uh, contributor to beta cell uh, death and dysfunction, uh, particularly the aggregates of IPP that myeloid amyloid and type 2 diabetes. So IHP is also known as amyloid. It's a beta cell peptide. It's normally produced and secreted along with insulin by beta cells. And in type 2 diabetes, it spontaneously aggregates to form toxic fibrils, very much like the fibrils, amyloid fibrils you see in Alzheimer's disease in the brain and other amyloidoses. This is what the plaque looks like in the island of an individual with type 2 diabetes. This is someone who died of complications of type 2 diabetes and was insulin dependent at the time of death, so a total beta cell a failure. And when you see the amount of amyloid, that's the white stain stuff there by a, a guy called Pyoflame and S, um, I think it's easy to make the argument that it might play a role in, uh, in beta, cell, beta cell loss. Uh, why does IPP form amyloid fibrils? So <clears throat> it probably is related to misfolding of the protein in the beta cell. We don't really know. But it undergoes a series of transitions, first through a oligomeric state where there's a sort of a soluble small aggregate. I show you this because this might be the most toxic form of the aggregate, and eventually you get the full-blown amyloid deposit, which you can see under light microscopy by that uh, white stain. The sequence of IPP gives clues as to why it forms amyloid. That Gale's region that's not so well conserved in the mid-portion of the molecule is the critical region that takes on a beta pleated sheet conformation causes the peptide to aggregate. You see it in any species in which iodine amyloid occurs, including humans, non-human primates. Interestingly, rodents have proline substitutions in that region, and th their beta sheet breakers, that amino acid, prevents uh, amyloid formation. And rodents do not get iodine amyloid associated with diabetes unless you make a transgenic animal that expresses the human form. We won't talk too much about pigs today, but we had an interesting finding published a couple of years ago that pig beta cells actually do quite well and they're being explored in transplant uh, as, a, as a source of uh, islets for the transplantation of type 1 diabetes. And when you see this pig IPP, it also has proline substitution, also doesn't form amyloid and is not uh, toxic to uh, beta cells. I mentioned islet transplantation. We've made the interesting finding that amyloid occurs not only in type 2 diabetes, but appears to form very rapidly in islet transplants. This is when islets isolated from cadaveric organ donor pancreases are isolated and transplanted into the liver of people with type 1 diabetes. Um, <clears throat> and two studies uh, point to uh, how rapid amyloid forms. This is actually uh, an autopsy section uh, from the liver of a type 1 diabetic who received an islet transplant. Uh, the islets were fine at the time of uh, transplantation, but a few years later, a little bit from the seed, but the red staining stuff is amyloid. It is deposited throughout the uh, 
the islets in this, uh, in this transplant. So amyloid occurs very rapidly in transplanted islets. It can also be duplicated when you transplant uh, transgenic uh, mouse islets expressing human IPP. The green stain there is uh, amyloid deposits just six weeks post transplant. So we started to explore the possibility that maybe rapid formation of amyloid in transplants might be a contributor to islet graft failure. Uh, we know that although islet transplants can get people with type 1 diabetes off of insulin initially, the vast majority uh, return to requiring insulin within a few years post-transplant. Now clearly there are issues of alloimmune and autoimmune rejection of the islet graft, but we believe that there are a number of non-immune contributors to islet graft failure, and perhaps the uh, islet amyloid is one. Um, and so <coughs> I want to talk next about <coughs> how our work in this area of islet transplantation and its uh, similarity to type 2 diabetes, because we're starting to uh, think that maybe the transplanted islets, you know, transplanted islet in a lot of ways is like a type 2 diabetic islet and perhaps should be treated as such. Again, it's been transformed by our relationship with others, not only at the CFRI in the clinical department, but also uh, elsewhere in Vancouver, including Vancouver Hospital, where Garth Warnick is. Uh, leading a, a human island transplant program. So our relationship with the clinicians, and it sounds similar to what John said at the beginning of our grant, uh, that we <clears throat> really tried to reach out and uh, develop uh, relationships with regular meetings. Uh, we provided some seed funding for uh, clinical basic uh, collaborations, catalyst awards, and we also, uh, from our the program support we get, we, we support a clinical research uh, coordinator who helps us with, with ethics and, and with other issues to do clinical and translational research for them. So one of the things we've been able to get from these interactions is access to human islands, which is really going to be transformative. They're not used for transplantation, they can be used for research. What we did here was we transplanted human islands into diabetic mice that are immune deficient, uh, non-skid mice, uh, so there's no immune rejection of these islets. And these graphs still fail, even without immune rejection. And the failure is associated with the accumulation of amyloid. Here it's staying blue, insulin is staying green. So you can see pretty massive deposition of amyloid in amongst the uh, beta cells within this islet graph. This was after uh, eight weeks. And interestingly, when we quantify histologically uh, amyloid formation and beta cell loss uh, in these graphs, it was associated with the uh, failure of these graphs, the return of the recipients to hyperglycemia. So here you see beta cell area on the left. Uh, those recipients that returned to hyperglycemia, in other words, their graph failed, had less beta cell area associated with more amyloid. So maybe amyloid is a potential target not just for type 2 diabetes, but also for uh, islet transplantation. We're exploring that now. This, of course, is correlative, not causative, but we're developing ways to try to <coughs> prevent amyloid formation as a potential therapy in mild transplants and type 2 diabetes. One is by peptide inhibitors of IPP aggregation. Uh, these were developed by Paul Fraser at the University of Toronto. You see on the left uh, aggregates of human IPP by electron microscopy forming those stick-like uh, fibrils. When we add uh, this peptide inhibitor uh, to uh, uh, human IPP uh, incubations, it totally obliterates the formation of these fibrils. We've taken that first into a culture model before we use it in the, uh, the transplant model. So when we culture human islets, we also get rapid amyloid formation associated with beta cell loss. These are islets that we've cultured for two weeks, I think. Um, uh, staying red for insulin, and you can see the loss of insulin staining in the dark uh, areas associated with amyloid formation in white. When we culture these islets in the presence of one of these peptide inhibitors, amyloid formation is ameliorated in the islands to uh, much better. If we look at uh, cell death by tunnel, the pink staining nuclei here are tunnel positive uh, beta cells. You can see quite a bit of cell death in the culture in the absence of the amyloid inhibitor, but the cells are protected when we inhibit uh, amyloid formation as just a modification uh, on the bottom. So we think this is proof of principle that, at least in this culture model, and likely in Transplants and types of diabetes that IPP aggregation can contribute to beta cell death and that it's a, a, a drugable target uh, in diabetes and island transplants. Uh, we're looking at other ways to target because delivering 
peptides at high concentrations to the beta cell has issues. Here we're using um, sRNA to inhibit um, IPP synthesis. Again, delivered ex vivo to human islets. Uh, we suppress um, uh, human IPP synthesis in these islets by uh, infecting them with an adenovirus expressing a human pro-IPP sRNA. And again, you can see an amelioration of the um, cell death in these cultures when we suppress uh, human IPP synthesis. Um, not showing you the amyloid stains, but it also uh, decreased uh, amyloid formation. So we think that there are some similarities then in the transplant model to type 2 diabetes. As I mentioned, I want to talk about one other, and it's another aspect of our research that's been uh, impacted greatly by um, by our relationship with, uh, with clinical researchers in children's and <coughs> Vancouver Hospital. So in type 2 diabetes, I mentioned earlier that there's a defect in proinsulin processing. One of the hallmarks uh, in people with type 2 diabetes is an elevation of the proinsulin to insulin ratio. Their beta cells don't process proinsulin very well. So if you look at the amount of proinsulin relative to the total amount of insulin in the blood, it's elevated in people with uh, type 2 diabetes. We looked in uh, islet transplant recipients and compared them to individuals with type 2 diabetes uh, and non-diabetic individuals. We were surprised to find that in transplant recipients, pro-insulin to insulin ratios are, uh, <coughs> are quite elevated, suggesting that there's a defect in the transplanted islet beta cell that resembles that in um, uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, those were in allograft recipients. Those patients were on exogenous insulin. There's also, they were on immune suppressive drugs that might have impacted the uh, islet, and they were also, islets were being subjected to allo autoimmune attack. So in collaboration with the group at the University of Cincinnati, where they do auto islet transplants, these are patients with uh, pancreatitis uh, who have a pancreatectomy, but their islets are isolated from their own pancreas and given back to them. Uh, so there's no immune issues, very similar to what we did in the human islet transplant into the immune deficient mice. And these patients have markedly elevated proinsulin to C-peptide ratio. We uh, use C-peptide here as a, uh, a surrogate measure for insulin because of the, uh, some of these patients go back on exogenous insulin to maintain normal glucose control. So we think this points to another defect in the transplanted islet that should be considered. Maybe we need to start uh, thinking about the transplanted islet like a type 2 diabetic islet. There are some others uh, that uh, uh, are also shared between the two beta cell mass is decreased in both, glucose stimulated insulin secretion is decreased in both. So we have a perspective coming out in diabetes soon uh, which talks about this and suggests that maybe um, targeting islets of transplantation might uh, benefit from therapeutic approaches using in, used in type 2 diabetes. Indeed, there's clinical trials now using incretin based therapy with the bio transplant recipients. Okay, so you know, I'm going to dangerous if I cannot bring up here in Jet's uh, territory. But, but the, the people in the Canucks family, both the owners and the coaching staff, uh, have been impacted by uh, diabetes. Canucks have been long time supporters of um, Children's Hospital through their philanthropic arm, the Canucks for Kids Fund. And we were really pleased when the um, Canucks for Kids Fund made a $2 million pledge to our program. And so this wouldn't have happened, I think, if we hadn't first had what you saw that we built with the recruits, uh, the funding, the infrastructure that Children's Hospital was able to uh, supply. And so we were able to make the case to the country based on that. Now we were looking for sustainability of the program and really operations and to develop new, you know, wild ideas, new collaborations. And so they have made a $2 million pledge uh, just two or three years ago for the next 10 years. And so we use this to support operations. We use it for catalyst awards, for the translational clinical research support that I've talked about, as well as for uh, training awards. And they actually came for a visit, I think, Martin Gilman is a winner figure, I think, from it's on the right there. And there's uh, Coach B, who's no longer, no longer with us. Um, this work, the last part of my talk, the, the work I want to present, has really been transformed by this, because it was initially funded by one of these catalyst awards, and uh, again, with a fantastic training and youth and program. And one of our new recruits, so Jan Essies came to us uh, from a lab that was pioneering in this area of uh, island inflammation. Uh, Zurich. And when we recruited him, I never really thought it would transform my research uh, the way it did. But Jan, when he was a postdoc in Zurich, made this very interesting observation that 
the islet is inflamed in um, type 2 diabetes. That is, in people with type, type 2 diabetes, if you look at the, their islets, their pancreas at autopsy, you can see increased numbers of macrophages. Here's stain brown with CD68, associated with loss of insulin, loss of beta cells, the red stain. So there's more macrophages in islets in type 2 diabetes. And if you were to stain this islet, you can almost see it uh, between the beta cells. There would also be amyloid deposition present. So given that in other amyloidoses, there's an association of amyloid deposits with inflammation, we want to look at whether IPP might be one of the in, uh, stimulators of island inflammation in type 2 diabetes, and in doing so, uh, indirectly influence beta cell function. So one of the first things Clara did was she took synthetic human IPP and took macrophages, these are bone marrow-derived macrophages, and put the IPP uh, on the macrophages. And the results were quite striking. So remember I said that the rodent form here, RIPP, will not form fibrils, right? It's got those prolines, doesn't um, aggregate. Human IPP aggregates in culture uh, in vitro spontaneously. You put human IPP aggregates on macrophages, they are stimulated to release pro-inflammatory cytokines here, TNF-alpha and IO-1 beta, both of which are toxic to uh, beta cells. <clears throat> do macrophages interact with amyloid and vivo? Yeah, we think they do. We have evidence that I won't show that um, uh, chemokines released by beta cells exposed to uh, IPP aggregates will attract macrophages, and macrophages then, we think, try to phagocytose these deposits. So here you see a deposit stain green, this is in the transgenic mouse model, and a macrophage in red that almost appears to be trying to gobble up this deposit. So maybe the macrophages are brought there to remove the deposit, but in doing so they um, incite further inflammation. So in work that uh, is just uh, coming out, I think, um, Clara wanted to understand the role of macrophages in beta cell dysfunction and type 2 diabetes and, and um, in pro-inflammatory response, partly because there had been some literature out there that suggested that other cells may be a source of uh, cytokines in uh, the islet. And so she used collagenate liposomes to deplete islets of macrophages quite effective and doesn't have a direct effect on uh, beta cells. So here she's isolated islets, treated them with these quadrate liposomes. The quadrate liposomes are phagocytosed by the macrophages and it kills them. Uh, and then she treated them with IPP aggregates and looked at cytokine production and uh, expression. And what you see here, uh, again, IL-1 beta and TNF expression <coughs> in response to human IPP treatment. So you see this quite large increase in cytokine expression, but when you remove the macrophages, and there's not that many macrophages in an island, maybe half a dozen, six to ten, it totally uh, obliterates the um, cytokine response. So all the cytokines we think, uh, virtually, that are at least in response to IPP aggregation that are being released are coming from uh, macrophages. FSL1 is a, a TLR2 agonist just used as a, as a positive. So what happens in vivo? Is this important <coughs> in vivo? So here we're using the transgenic model, the mouse that expresses human IPP in its beta cells. We put them on a high-fat diet. They get glucose intolerance associated with amyloid formation in the transgenic uh, animals. <coughs> and we treated, she treated these animals in vivo with alternating liposomes or PBS liposomes that were controlled. And to make a long story short, the transgenic animals have impaired glucose tolerance, and that's normalized by removal of macrophages. Uh, so we think that this inflammatory milieu that IPP stimulates, recruiting macrophages and the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines within the island is important for um, <coughs> glucose intolerance, at least in the context of um, what IPP is doing. And this fits with a clinical trial that uh, was published out of Switzerland a few years ago in the England Journal of Medicine where they used and a Kinra, an IL-1 receptor antagonist, they treated patients with type 2 diabetes, their glucose levels got better, their beta cell function improved markedly. How are these macrophages seeing IPP aggregates? So this is unpublished data uh, now that Clara hopes to submit soon. We think it's uh, perhaps being seen as a danger signal recognized by toll-like receptors, and particularly TLR2. Uh, these are uh, cells in a reporter assay 
to detect uh, TLR binding uh, in response to uh, exposure to human IPP aggregates. And essentially what this shows is that only cells expressing TLR2 respond to human IPP aggregates. So we think TLR2 and more specifically a TLR26 heterodimer uh, are the toll like receptors that are responding to human IPP aggregates. Interestingly, we also think it's these early aggregates, the oligomers, and not the full-blown fibrils that the TLRs are detecting. Because if we let the fibrils age, if you leave the IPP in the dish for a few hours, uh, and it moves past the oligomer stage of aggregate to a full-blown fibril, it has no effect on the TLR activation. So oligomers are probably the toxin. Uh, she's also done this uh, in bone marrow derived macrophages from TLR2 knockout mice and mice black and which is the adapter protein by which TLR2 and other TLR2s act. And in the absence of TLR2, uh, IPP, human IPP has virtually no impact on cytokine production from bone marrow derived macrophages. So we think TLR2 is the uh, important primary. Suggests so potentially a target. So here's our, our, our working model for what's going on in terms of how these beta cell stressors might synergize in type 2 diabetes and, and possibly in transplants as well. So there's some underlying beta cell dysfunction, perhaps insulin resistance is increasing IPP production as well as that. Fibrils start to form. Early fibrils are detected by TLR2. There's also release of chemokines that are attracting macrophages to uh, the islet. Uh, this um, incites an inflammatory response within the macrophage, uh, including um, production of pro-IL-1 beta. Of course, you need two signals for IL-1 beta to be produced, signal 1 and signal 2, one being from the inflammasome. The evidence that we have uh, uh, fairly recently that I'm not showing, that it may be that the more mature fibril uh, is phagocytose and is activating the alpha 3 inflammasome, and that's how we're getting IL-1 beta production. IL-1 also will, in sort of a feed-forward mechanism, not only uh, induce beta cell dysfunction, but it appears to be a master regulator of the inflammatory response in these uh, macrophages. So this suggests to us, and in keeping with the clinical data that I uh, had uh, just mentioned, that the IL-1 receptor might be a good target, at least in terms of IPP-induced islet inflammation and type 2 diabetes and islet transplant. So the last thing I want to show you in unpublished is work where Clara has given uh, mice uh, anakinra or the IL-1 receptor antagonist. And these are mice uh, which are genetically obese, the agouti mouse, and we've crossed the human IPV transgenome this background. So they're obese, they get associated with the obesity, they get glucose intolerance, and that is worsened by the uh, expression of the human IPV transgenome. They do get uh, amyloid formation. This is what a pilot looks like at an aged including mouse expressing human IPP, you can see quite a lot of amyloid deposited um, throughout the island. So that label is not quite right. It's actually the blue stain is amyloid, and the insulin is, uh, is red. So she took these animals and treated them with IL-1 receptor agonist, uh, antagonist, sorry, daily for eight weeks, and then did the histology and followed the mice for uh, glucose homeostasis. And again, to make a uh, long story relatively short, the obese mice in particular have glucose intolerance uh, that's exacerbated by the expression of human IPP, and that's ameliorated by treatment with the IL-1 receptor antagonist. So this appears to be one important mechanism, at least, by which um, IPP, we think by reducing out of inflammation, is impacting glucose homeostasis. What happens to the islets? Do they, does it impact amyloid formation? because now we might impact macrophage function in the islet, and we think they're actually coming to gobble up the graphs. Well, interestingly, in the lean mice expressing human IPP, there's not a lot of amyloid, you don't have a lot of drive for amyloid formation, but treatment with the IL-1 receptor antagonist actually markedly reduced amyloid formation. So what we're thinking is maybe the pro-inflammatory state induced by the macrophages is inducing further beta cell dysfunction, and that's exacerbating amyloid formation. In the obese mice, we were surprised, a little disappointed that it didn't have any effect. Even though it had a fairly profound effect on glucose tolerance, it didn't affect amyloid formation. Maybe that we're just giving it too late, and maybe that the drive for amyloid is, is, uh, is, is too uh, great. Maybe that it has to be given 
uh, earlier in the pathogenesis of the disease, but the drug still did improve glucose tolerance. Um, uh, at this point, these plaques may be too big for macrophages uh, to remove. Uh, but to summarize, uh, so what we think then is that there are a number of targets suggested for therapeutic translation that, uh, of relevance for not only type 2 diabetes but island transplants, that there is IPP misfolding and aggregation that by a TLR2 mechanism uh, activates macrophages to uh, produce a number of pro-inflammatory cytokines, particularly IL-1 beta and TNF, and that would produce well, results in beta cell death and dysfunction. So maybe there's some targets here that we're working on all of these inhibitors of amyloid formation, the sRNA or the methane inhibitors. We're looking at uh, TLR2 antibodies uh, as a, a way of uh, slowing this progression, as well as I mentioned, uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, including an IL-1 receptor antagonist, IL-1 beta antibodies are in clinical trial as well as uh, TNF alpha antibodies. And so to come back to this slide then, uh, talked about all of these stressors that uh, we think contribute to beta cell death and dysfunction. And I think one of the take home messages is it's not so simple as them acting individually on the, on the beta cell on their own. There seems to be a, a, a synergism here. The data I'm not showing you is that in presence of cholesterol accumulation, there is also more inflammation. Cholesterol can drive uh, amyloid formation. Hyperglycemia probably drives all of these things as well. So these are all targetable, I think. Targeting upstream in the pathogenesis of the disease may be observed beta cell function in type 2 diabetes. And just to come back to um, uh, our center, this is hopefully give me a taste of how my own research at least was really transformed by um, the creation of the center. If I was to summarize what worked for us, one would be to have the plan. It took years, it really started, you know, about 2001, 2002 on, on uh, napkins. Um, uh, but you really do need to sketch it out and then go chase the money, particularly uh, places like CFI. Uh, you need a lot of partners, and sometimes non-traditional partners come to the, the table, and, and there is sort of this amplifying effect that one partner, if you get one partner on board, another, another uh, will come, and once you have something that starts to grow, people want to be associated with it. And then it's really the people. Um, just recruit terrific people and let them go, give them some mentorship. Um, support the trainees because they, as I said, really drive the, uh, drive the bus. But it's been a, a lot of fun, and so we're uh, looking forward to what happens in the next uh, 10 years and invite any of you who are out of our way to come, uh, come visit. Uh, and I'll close by thanking a number of collaborators in the scientific studies. I mentioned a lot of the funding uh, partners uh, for the center and for my own research and my lab, and particularly at Point Clara in the middle there. Um, Thanks, Bruce, very much for that overview on the development of the center and also uh, on that exciting research that opened up. Uh, <coughs> Hi, Lori. That was an excellent talk. Um, I'm going to have two questions. The first one is, I mean, you showed in your transplant studies, you showed a beautiful image of an islet where you stain for insulin, amyloid, and glucagon. But it's pretty tough to see. Do you get any um, amyloid accumulation in the alpha cells? No, um, we don't. So IPP is not made in alpha cells. Um, there is some debate in the field whether the initial oligomers, pre or aggregates, whatever you want to call them, uh, form within the beta cell or all extracellular. Our bias is that most of it's happening outside of the cell. And one of the reasons we think that that's the case is that we can drug it with peptides that are probably not getting into the, to the cell. But no, alpha cells are actually left pretty much uh, intact. Uh, in fact, in some of the models, there's almost a, a replacement of the missing beta cells by, by alpha cells. Yeah, I was, I was just wondering, because you have that return, uh, that fairly quick return back to hyperglycemic state, and I was just wondering if the alpha cell had any contribution to that at all? Well, I think this is really emerging in type 2 diabetes, that the alpha cell does. I mean, glucagon uh, receptor antagonists are in trial now, and at least in animal models are pretty effective. I think glucagon is really critical for fasting, hyperglycemia, and clearly glucagon is dysregulated in, in diabetes. So uh, uh, we haven't looked 
looked at it closely in these models, except to say that uh, it's not impacted largely by island inflammation or amyloid in our animal models. Can I have one more? Oh, sorry. Sure. Okay, go Just ahead. one more quick one. Have you, have you looked at the impact of the amyloid accumulation on mitochondrial function in the basal? No, but so again, speaking to when you um, do recruit people in, so and, and the benefits to your own program. So Dan Luciani, one of the recruits, is a beta cell death investigator with real interest in mitochondrial uh, pathways and the beta cell death dysfunctions, um, studying the BCL family of proteins in beta cells. So um, we're planning to to do some of those studies across the way. argument of how this you get a feed forward cycle. I'm curious as to how you think this starts in susceptible people. And and secondly, you know, sort of what is the genetic piece of this? Are, are there variations in amyloid protein with polymorphisms that put people at risk? Or has this shown up in any GWAS? Um, or, oh, that's an excellent question. So so I was just at a beta cell failure in NGC with a lot of people in this field, and that was one of the very questions that was asked, how does it all start? So in terms of genetic susceptibility, there are, uh, in GWAS studies, there are genes that are involved um, in regulation of beta cell mass and function that have come up. Um, uh, the ZNT8 zinc transporter gene. Um, uh, interestingly, um, there's a locus uh, which has a couple of candidate genes, one of which is a beta cell development gene, but one is insulin degrading enzyme, which also degrades M and IPP, so maybe defective degradation of the uh, uh, protein is involved. In terms of which stressor starts it, uh, it's a good question, and, and um, you know, maybe in terms of therapy, it doesn't matter, but our data would suggest that, at least in terms of the inflammation, IPP is a very early and important Trigger. I think underlying all of this is probably insulin resistance, driving production, right? Driving uh, glucose intolerance, driving IPK insulin production. Um, and interestingly, and you know, I shoot myself in the foot a little bit by saying this, but, but the insulin sensitizers actually, you know, have a lot of power here potentially to induce beta cell rest. And in fact, the analogs would suggest that that's the case. So, Insulin resistance is probably a, a driver as well, combined with the um, perhaps underlying genetic susceptibility genes not to it, but most of the susceptibility genes can be related back to the beta cell in, in some uh, way or another. And then once it starts, I think you've got this, you know, feed forward. Uh, uh, certainly the lipids you can see from diet as well, um, cholesterol. And do you think there's a connection between systemic inflammation and, and outside inflammation? Yeah. I mean, we're pretty sensitive to that because especially you know, reviewers have criticized us when we give the poverty microsome systemically, we're going to impact adipose tissues. We, we don't see big changes. I didn't show the data, I don't think, about the insulin sensitivity. So we think it's, at least in our studies, it's in the, um, in the island. Uh, but I guess the question could be, you know, are the mechanisms that induce um, inflammation in adipose tissue the same as in the uh, islet? And uh, we don't know. Uh, there's some saw an interesting talk from Jonathan Schertzer about uh, the bacteria in adipose being a insider of inflammation in, in um, obesity. One thing's for sure, though, is that the, island, the IPP will be and we're really convinced that that's an important player. Uh, Tom? <coughs> so my, my question is along the same lines. This is all, uh, in some ways, very new to me. I'm a transplant nephrologist um, and uh, with an interest in diabetes. But this, this conversation reminds me a lot of what the transplant community went through um, 
for the last many years where there was a, a great focus on fibrosis and tubular atrophy as, the, as, as a disease. Um, and, and I think it's different than the model you're presenting because clearly this amyloid process is, a, is an amplifier of cell death uh, and, and is very directly implicated in the demise of the beta cell. But so my question was similar. I mean, in, in the transfer world, what it actually came back down to was, well, it's inflammation that's, that's yeah. initiating the process. And, and in your model, you talk a lot about the IAPP as, as being a cause of inflammation. But I wonder whether there's inflammation that's starting the process in the first place, and this is serving as an amplification. So, right. So inflammation, I think, is being appreciated in island transplantation as a, as a contributor. There's at least animal studies where anti-inflammatory drugs have been given in island transplant models and improved um, transplant function. Data, I didn't have time to show you. The Clara published um, uh, last year. Um, suggested that um, inflammation is an important player. I mean, certainly in the, the so I showed you in the EVO data, but the, uh, in the Goody mouse, but prior to that, she'd done anti-chemo studies in the transplant model and improved things there as well. But that's related to IFPP specifically. Interestingly, when we do transplants, so we've struggled a bit with um, the recipient model. We want to do this in a syngenetic model to remove the alloimmune parts, so we usually do human islands into non skid immune deficient mice, or with the transgenic animals, we'll transplant them into, we did transplant them into non skid mice, we just started transplanting them into a syngenetic model, so black six for black six, and actually you get more of a response, so uh, an amyloid response and a worsening of the lupus mm -hmm. which suggests now that non skids do have macrophages, but I mean, there are defects in the innate immunity in those. So it's got us thinking that this is actually maybe initiating as well. But, and just the surgery, right? The incision here we do the, in the water we do the kidney. You're going to release chemokines. You're going to induce um, an innate immune response. I think that is accepted actually. Peter, <coughs> congratulations on your triple P approach to uh, success in your institute. Uh, my question is around. How you've nicely tied together two seemingly disparate elements of metabolic syndrome, that is the hypercholesterolemia and the, and the um, uh, insulin, lack of insulin, insulin sensitivity. And so, and the way that you've shown high cholesterol through the ABCA1 dysfunction, seemingly, or at least in Tangiers. But um, so, would that uh, then lead one to believe that if you were to give it cholesterol lowering regimen like statin? or diet that you would improve beta yeah. function, and is that being shown independently? So we've tried some studies in the islands, and it's been a bit um, messy. And if you look at the clinical data, and it's interesting because, you know, some of the ones put on statins, right? Drinking water. Yeah, so, <laughs> so actually the data for diabetes are not that good, and there may even be an increased incidence, right? Depending on the stat, uh, so I, it's, I think we need more research. There's some suggestion actually that, that there may be a pro-inflammatory um, aspect to statins, right, through protein correlation and activation of non-receptors. Um, non but yeah, we would predict that um, if accumulation of intracellular cholesterol and basal important that statins would help. But at least in the limited studies, and we haven't pursued them super active, but maybe we should, or uh, one of the things that we're starting to think is that ABCA1 does a, normally does a really good job, right? So it's critical. Obviously, you knock it out, it's bad. Tangier's patients and their carriers have issues. But when it's there and functioning normally, even on a high-fat diet, it would take a long time for cholesterol to accumulate. And ABCG1, the data I didn't talk about, is also there and is um, helping, even when ABCA1 is um, uh, defective. That being said, you know, there are some studies at least in animal models, smart brain facilities, fed mice a high fat diet, and responders, those that got hyperglycemic, and then he did an analysis of the islets, and the best correlation was with islet cholesterol. So he's a believer that this is important. But my sense is that ABCA1 normally does a pretty good job, and it may be, and there are lots of people.
you comment on the normal role of <coughs> PP? Yeah. Um, your proposed therapy with the peptide, is that going to cause any problems? Well, the normal place has been made say we have them, we don't really have any marked phenotype. Uh, it's very strain dependent and messy. Um, I think the most convincing data, um, even the receptor hasn't really been identified. It's in the CGRP calcitonin family, so if you put of these uh, receptor vectoring modifying proteins of the ramp proteins that they're so it's thought that um, it can bind to CGRP receptors once there's a modifying protein attached to it and that creates an IPP receptor. Uh, but it's so even the receptor hasn't been unequivocally identified. Um, high doses can produce um, calcitonin and CGRP like effects, but I think the most convincing data is for effects on satiety brain and gastric emptying. It actually uh, inhibits um, gastric emptying. When, when the Amelin Corporation in San Diego was, had a clinical trial, um, because at high doses it was impacting insulin sensitivity, um, the patients were complaining of stomach upset. And so so uh, that seems to make some sense physiologically too, that you, know, you absorb nutrients in the gut, the message to the pancreas goes back and says slow down. Uh, but, you know, from a therapeutic point of view, uh, apart from that, like the pep, uh, uh, if you gave full peptide, if that's what you're getting at, then you, that would be potentially a, a side effect, although our peptide inhibitors would not be, the small peptides would not be predicted to bind to the receptor. Um, in terms of suppressing it, if one were to do an sRNA approach, you know, at least based on the knockout mice, you would predict. Uh, it's, I should also say it's, it's expressed in sensory neurons in, in small amounts, um, and that's not really sorted out uh, of what it's doing there. Um, a question now. The, the amylin for the IPP production, does that go up in the effect you... Uh, yeah, so... You, you, you mentioned that you, you think it's outside of the beta cells, or you're not quite sure, um, at least where, where the fibrils have been forming outside them. Are they, are they building up in the beta cells? Yeah. So, yeah, it's a matter of uh, uh, quite a bit of debate. So, so, IPP parallels insulin in terms of synthesis and gene expression. Right? The promoters are fairly similar in translational control. They can be dissociated um, in small amounts. And the, the molar ratio of IPP to insulin is about 100 to 1 insulin to IPP. So, it's not made in small But when you're insulin resistant, so it goes up. When beta cells fail, it'll go down along with insulin. Type 1 diabetes, it's, it's essentially, um, essentially absent. So, so is there more insulin trapped in those beta cells as well? Does that go up? Is it, is it you mentioned, the cholesterol? Yeah, with an exercise like So in the mice, um, yeah, insulin content goes up. It's just kind of interesting. So everything can build so up. So synthesis is fine, but yeah. So that would fit with, with that happening. So we've just done the cross of the IPP mice to the ABCA1 knockout, and they do get more amyloid. So that fits with that idea, right? Again, with this sort of uh, synergy of mice, like, well, we're just writing um, that out now. In terms of where it's forming, it, we really struggle with it because the this toxic form, the oligomers that I was talking about, are very difficult to detect. There's antibodies that one group's made that are argued to detect just the oligomeric form, like it's confirmational epitome, uh, but it's, you know, it's a bit dodged, not everyone believes it, and so that's by amino staining, um, and to pick them up by electron microscopy is very difficult, so really the evidence for intracellular form, you never see full-blown fibrils in the cell, but there is some evidence for the whole universe being there, and it's all by amino staining. Thanks very much.